Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I wish that we had like gifts of tiaras for you all to wear and <laughs> so, get, yeah, get a little come prepared. <laughs> practice before the coronation. So, but thank you all for coming. And I know you'll be fascinated by the uh, the discussion today about finding freedom. Omid Scobie's book, co-written with Carolyn Durand. I hope I pronounced Durand right. Correct. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's the uh, royal editor at Harper's Bazaar. You see him on Good Morning America, and he does the ABC podcast, The Air Pod. And um, I had to kind of wait a minute before I got the pun there because I'm not much of a <laughs> things in the ears person, as you can tell by the slipping maybe going on here. He has a new book coming out this year about the future of the royal family in August. Do you have a working title yet? It's called Endgame. Oh, and all it's right. Inside the royal family and the future of the monarchy. Okay. And I know so that sounds very dramatic, but it's simply looking at what the endgame is for the royal family. Or does it have a question mark, or is it just endgame dot dot dot? I'm leaving it to the reader to decide. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have so much ground to cover, but I want to make sure we have some time for your questions as well. So when you have them, I'll look for you, and you'll need to stand up and say them, and then I'll repeat the questions so the audio can pick it up, uh, because we don't have microphones for you here in this room. But again, thank you for being here. And when I, when I think of, of the monarchy right now, I think of Diana's phrase, there were three of us in this marriage, but I'm thinking of a different marriage, which is the monarchy the people, and then the intruder is the press, in a way. And I'm not talking about our kind of press, because I've covered the royal family, too. I'm going to be at the mm. coronation, as you will. I'm talking about the tabloid press and what a misery it's made for the lives of, of the royal family, which is never like the press. If you go back and look at cartoons of King George IV with his big butt <laughs> um, being bared to the world in print, yes, you can see why there's a bit of antipathy. But... Um, before I do that, let's do just a survey. I'm going to give you three choices. Team Harry William, or Team Harry and Meghan, Team uh, <laughs> Charles and William, and Team both sides. So Team Harry and Meghan, Team Charles and William, and Team kind of in the middle. OK, all right, we'll ask you afterwards and see whether you've changed any. That's very any. equal. You know, if it we was, were in the UK, nice. that would look very different. Well, that's, <laughs> I think that's another point, too, is that at you know, you look at Harry and Meghan coming here, like, who wouldn't want to live in California first? Right. But Americans have, at least up until now, uh, come on, admit it. All you East Coast people who are here, you're thawing out by now. Come on, <laughs> give us this. Um, and, uh, but also, uh, the, the royal families had a pretty uncritical reception here in the United States compared to Britain. And I know when I was spray-painted years ago by Prince Andrew, you may all hiss now, um, the mail I got from the UK was uniformly, oh, we're so sorry, he's such a jerk. And from the US, I would get letters from people saying we should have pissed on you instead. And I thought, oh. oh so wow. I know, pretty <laughs> nasty stuff. So you've, you've spent so much time talking to people who are so much in the know about Harry and Meghan. And I think that what we saw, what I saw in your book, was so many instances of a culture clash between the US and Britain, between the royal family and people who are famous, like Meghan, but not that kind of famous, uh, and, and the racism differences, too. Yeah. And even you've experienced some of this because your mother's Iranian and your father's Scottish, so, so you are not out of the loop in terms of what this means. So can you talk about some of these cultural differences that may be at the heart of a lot of the problems of that course. you lay out so well in your book? I think what's so interesting is that people often ask me, what is it that Meghan did wrong to sort of end up in this situation that she's in now, largely disliked by the British public, uh, sort of out of favor with the institution of the monarchy? And I always kind of go back to day one at a time when even within the institution they knew very little about her. Simply her presence was enough to kind of shake things up within the institution. This is Britain's oldest establishment. And Meghan, in, in so many ways, did not fit the norms of members of the royal family. She was not blue-blooded, she was American, she was a divorcee, she was biracial. And so simply by standing in the House of Windsor, about to take on this senior role in the royal family, that was enough to ruffle feathers, that was enough to create a discomfort. And I think that there's one thing that always brings the kind of biggest reaction within the, the monarchy, within the institution, is change whether that is a journalist challenging a different narrative or a member of the family just being different. And so Meghan 
just being there represented that difference. And, you know, I think for the British press, you know, Meghan arrived during a really polarizing time in the UK. We were sort of deep in talks of Brexit and the country was very divided. And so there was already a very negative feeling towards outsiders and people wanting to kind of change what the fabric of Britain was. Right. The little Britain philosophy, eyes. Britain for the British and to hell with everybody exactly. else. Exactly. So I think it was sort of almost a clash of timing, but also just her being there. It was enough to make those within power within the institution, and I'm talking about the private aides and the, the, those around family members, feel quite uncomfortable at someone that is, wasn't part of the plan. And so, of course, Meghan was then doomed since day one. And, you know, you talk about my experience as well. I've covered the royal family full time for about six years now, but my first royal engagements were in 2011. So I have traveled the world with the younger royals many times over. I've been on hundreds of royal engagements with them over the years. I've spent private time with William, Kate, Harry, Meghan, uh, the, the more senior royals. But even myself have found the sort of, found myself against the narrative like, well, you, you don't belong there. Why are you writing about our royal family? I still see it on Twitter every day. You get that kind of day reaction. Because there's a kind of feeling of, well, y if as an outsider, because people perhaps only see one side of my ethnicity, um, why are you entitled to have an opinion on something that is so intrinsically British? And so I think Meghan also coming into the institution and having ideas about how she wanted to carry out the role and do things slightly differently or within sort of her wheelhouse, that was enough for, again, people to feel like, who are you to have an opinion on this? Um, and as you point out, too, the, the, the royal family does change, but it's kicking and screaming. And then once it finds out what its best interests are, it's like, oh, we, we were for this all along. Yeah. And you saw that because 100 years ago in April, the first commoner for 300 years married into the royal family, Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, who became Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother. And she did the first walkabout and the idea of a royal touching you know, these commoners who were waiting to see. Diana did the same thing with how she related to people in a very personal way. And only after they thought, oh, this is terrible, did they see that people liked it and it was giving them good press and good mm. polling numbers and said, okay, let's do some more of this. And I think Meghan was probably the very same thing. I think maybe one of the differences is that the pace at which it happened. Can you talk about, because it all seemed to happen so quickly. It was almost like the big bang. It was all very close and tight and then it just got boom. Yeah, I mean, if we think back to when Kate, uh, the Princess of Wales, married William in, in, in you know, got over a decade now. P uh, prior to that, there'd been this sort of slow rollout of her as a sort of future member of the royal family, as a future queen consort. And all the nastiness that went along with it. And her. there was a really uncomfortable start where, of course, the tabloids all jumped and sort of dissected her private life and her sort of middle-class background was criticized and there were all these jokes about her mother who'd been an air hostess. It was really unpleasant, but it faded out because I think the country very quickly realized that A, they were on her side. No one actually disliked her. It was the press being the press, but also within the institution of the monarchy, they did everything they could to sort of rally around the media to feel like, well, if you behave in a certain way, your access will be better. And so by the time William and Kate were at the altar, she could do no wrong in the eyes of the British public or in the British press. With Meghan, that sort of turnaround of her introduction as the girlfriend of Harry to then becoming the Duchess of Sussex and taking on this huge role within the institution was crammed into such a short amount of time. And within that time, the palace were presented with issues that I don't think they had ever thought about before. Suddenly it wasn't about press intrusion, but it was also about the misogyny and the racism within the coverage in the UK. You know, I don't know how closely people followed the tabloid coverage at the very start, but you know, Meghan, who grew up in California, but nowhere near Crenshaw or wherever it was that the- uh, Compton. Compton, that the tabloids suggested she did, called her as a child from a gang-scarred 
background. They said her mother was... Uh, they lived in Woodland Hills, and for those of you who know Los Angeles... <laughs> they said she was straight out of Compton. They said that her mother's dreadlocks would make the queen feel awkward over afternoon tea. It was sort of just this series of microaggressions and really inappropriate language in opinion pieces and in the papers that Harry and Meghan noticed really early on that the palace hoped would disappear or come to an end, but never did. Yeah. And that's why we've reached this moment today where Harry and Meghan say, well, we weren't protected. No one looked out for us. No one intervened. Because we know that the royal family have a great relationship with the British press. It's that sort of back and forth that has kept the monarchy in focus for so long in the UK. But well, they're the tree falling in the forest. If the press isn't there to say they're there, what's the point of doing what they do? Right? Exactly. As the Queen said, to, to be seen is to be believed, and, and the press make that happen. Um, but despite that close relationship with the press, there wasn't that same protection or sort of like ring of steel thrown up around Meghan as there was Kate's, because ultimately... Meghan is not the f or was not the future queen consort. She was not but, marrying an heir. But before she was engaged, I mean, mm. the, the, the palace didn't do that even with Diana because there was no formal engagement. Yeah. And, but even after the engagement, you're saying they didn't step up. That was the moment where Harry had hoped things would change, mm -hmm. that now that we are husband and wife, things would be different, that you will be looked after in the same way that my brother's wife was. And that didn't happen. That moment never came. And I think that... You know, for those who have read Harry's memoir, it sort of, that sort of really ties into his feelings as a spare, that he's not afforded the same privileges or the same protection or the same level as care, because ultimately his use is not great, is not as great as his brother's. Oh, I'll ask you down the road about spare and your reaction yeah. to some of the things in it, but it, it isn't surprising that Megan, for all her celebrity, would not be conversant with that level and the practices. But Harry seemed like all of a sudden, when he got engaged to Megan, the scales fell from his eyes. And he said, my family does this, and my family yeah. does that, when he'd been living in the middle of it for his entire life. I think, you know, many people ask me, is Megan the one that sort of drove this decision to step away from their royal roles? Is she the reason why they are where they are today? And I think that actually as someone that had followed him and gotten to know him since 2011, I always felt like whoever he ended up with would have been just the sort of teammate that he needed to have the confidence to make the changes in his life that he wanted. He was, as, and as we've discovered more recently, a deeply unhappy man for many years, a man without purpose, a man without guidance within the institution, whilst he would look over and see his brother, of course, since childhood, groomed for this huge role and treated in a very different way. And I think for Harry, he felt that that treatment was across the board. So to his wife, to his child, they were all sort of felt like second-class citizens within that family. And of course, it is ultimately a business at the end of the, of mm -hmm. the day. There is, an, there is a ladder of, of hierarchy, but they're also a family. And so I think for Harry, it was impossible for him to marry the two and feel comfortable with that. Uh, I think they had so much sympathy with how unhappy he felt and the treatment of Meghan, which was horrifying to see here. And you talk about the difference between racism in Britain mm. and racism in the United States. And, and, uh, and, and as a consequence, they tried to find a way, when they couldn't find the help they wanted in the royal family, they had to try to find a way to help themselves. Yeah. And a lot of people thought, good for them for breaking, finding freedom. And other people thought, why couldn't they like stick around a little longer and yeah. make it work? Because sometimes, as you put, point out in the book, they could be very impatient. And that did not serve them well in the long run. So talk about some of the dynamics in their ideas about Sussex Royal and how they wanted to yeah. structure their lives and how that worked within the royal family. They're definitely a couple that run hot and I think really enjoy getting things done quickly. And that was the thing that I noticed kind of sent ripples throughout the entire institution once they were kind of a working force was that they would go from one project to the next. And, you know, so one minute Megan's launching a clothing line to raise money for women getting back into the workplace. And then six weeks later, she's editing the September issue of Vogue 
whilst pregnant. And then four weeks after that, there's another initiative. And, and I think that they really enjoyed having that purpose and that role, that role as like Commonwealth Youth Ambassadors, all of these great things that they'd taken on, and they wanted more of it. And they were almost working at a pace that we're not used to seeing royal family members do. Or, you know, if or we look more or just in the kind of the working thing in Britain, where a full day is just yeah. a day, and you're not expected to do emails at midnight. And the workplace in the UK is definitely a more like genteel environment than it is over here. And I've worked for most of my career with US media, so I know both sides. But for Meghan, who was, as you say, sending those emails at all hours of the day and wanting to join the meetings, I remember. Um, at Kensington Palace with William and Kate, the private aides would get one moment a month to sit down and go through the diary and the dates ahead. For Harry and Meghan, they would just drop by in the office almost on a daily basis to be like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, what can, we, what can we do? Who should we talk to? But that just isn't how it's done. And so, again, it was this case of sort of going against what was the norm within the institution. And it's why we've then heard stories more recently about how unhappy staff were or they felt sort of not respected in this. And that the Queen dressed down Meghan, supposedly, for being abrupt or hurting the feelings of staff? There's definitely, uh, I think certainly in the case of William, William felt that way, that Meghan was more abrupt with the staff that they shared at the time at Kensington oh. Palace and that he would hear things back that she was too involved or you know asking for too many changes to things but ultimately that's what happens when you're dealing with a perfectionist you know this was a, a woman who knew you know exactly what she wanted she had already had a career she already knew how to do a lot of things and in fact she brought great ideas to the firm at the time. And I mean, I remember when Harry and Meghan launched their Sussex Royal Instagram account. And at the time, within the other ha royal household offices, it was felt that they were giving too much away and it started to feel like a celebrity account. And they were doing videos and they had a videographer and it was a lot. And then about a year and a half later, I noticed that Kensington Palace were looking to hire a uh, social media director for William and Kate because they wanted to launch right. a YouTube channel and they wanted to kind of change their social media content. And then I noticed the same happen in Charles and Camilla's office. And so I think for Harry and Meghan, they were often the first to do those things, but because of their place in, in the kind of line of succession or just within the hierarchy of the family, it shouldn't have been them leading the way in those moments. And so they become a threat. And because everything really had to go through the CEO, which was the queen, and maybe that wasn't fast enough, or maybe there was resistance, or maybe too many layers between them as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because when you look back at their time within the House of Windsor, the queen was the one person that they really didn't have issues with. You know, she was happy to sort of let them get on with it. But of course, around the Queen are, is a layer of courtiers and aides and people that are the go-betweens on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Is why I remember a family member who I won't name within, within the family told me that it's impossible for us to have normal relationships with each other because every conversation we have, every fight that we have, every appointment we want to make has about two or three household staffers between us who are just as involved in our business, who are just as sort of busy in the middle of it, and then often using that information as currency within their own households because... It's so medieval. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they've got <laughs> smartphones now, but it might as well be the 14th century, right? And the yeah. War of the Roses. And you say they have smartphones, but Prince Charles still refuses oh, to he use does. one. But there is a WhatsApp so for the royal family. There is a, so. There's a cousin's WhatsApp group, yeah, for the I'm, young I'm boys. glad to hear that, so they can all still get... <laughs> I don't I, know if Harry and Meghan are still in it. I, 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 d I think <laughs> it's charming to do that. And But when I was thinking of Harry, back, back to his own sense of revelation and liberation, mm. um, I think it's the reverse of Sleeping Beauty. Like, she's the one who kissed the prince, and he woke up and yeah. made himself aware of the greater world that he had explored, but at a bit of a remove, as you point out. Totally, and I think it, it goes back to that narrative that we've seen in, in the British tabloids, that she was the one that wore the trousers, that she but was she the was one... she was the Duchess of Windsor 2.0, right? That drove 
Harry out of the institution, but I was I was with Meghan on her last day of royal engagements in the UK, and it was the day that she was going to get on a flight and go over to Canada. This before was just before the, COVID, right? This was just before COVID, so it was early March 2020, and it was her last engagement. It was a private sort of gathering for one of her patronages, and afterwards she had a little goodbye with the staff that she'd worked with because she was going to go straight from that to the Commonwealth service at Westminster Abbey, which we all saw those stony looks between Harry and Meghan and William and Kate. Things were obviously really bad at the time. And Meghan had been saying goodbye to some of her staff members, and I stopped and chatted with her before she left, and she, we hugged, and we, you know, I wished her well, and I didn't know if that would be it. Um, and she broke down in tears, and she said, I have tried everything I can to make this work. I was willing to give everything up. I would have left this with absolutely nothing if he allowed me to. But it was Harry that was the one that felt like he needed to save his wife and his future family from a situation that he felt was untenable. And I think that's the message that often gets lost in all of the coverage about Harry and Meghan, is that this was very much his decision, and the life that they're living today is very much the life that he has made happen. Otherwise, I think Meghan would have stayed in it for much longer, but mm -hmm. who knows what the consequences would have been because of that. We've seen what happens with other family members. We've heard from Sarah Ferguson, Princess Diana. When you try and make it work for too long, it doesn't end up going well yeah and then the changes may come but a generation too late yeah. do you any good um you have a chapter called half in half out and it's about how they wanted to stay as working royals but still establish um their own independent yeah. life and income and it's so hard to do it's why you know there's something called the sovereign grant which is essentially the allowance for the royal family and this goes back to george the third because understand the monarchy owned essentially all of england and in exchange for titles grants income they slowly said all right you give us money every year to maintain and we'll cede you these controls and i hope i have that more or less right um but when you're when you're taking from the sovereign grant as a working royal uh, your line was um, uh, that taking public money puts you at the mercy, mercy of being in the public yeah. eye. Um, th but there's so many nuances, and there have been royals who've tried this before, because they're the peripheral royals who just like go out and do engagements now and then, the queen's cousins. But in the immediate royal family, when the, um, uh, the Countess of Wessex tried to keep her PR firm going and still be a working royal, she got set up by a tabloid with a fake sheet going in and she started talking about the queen and of course they busted that story. Mm. So let's deal with that part first of how you would have found a balance to be royal without compromising the ro whole royal mechanism with making money almost in any fashion, I think. How, what did they conceive of that as it, being? Yeah, it was. I think for the couple they thought it was doable, but I think just as you described, it's really complicated. And I think once you start bringing in private earnings into a system that relies on a public fund, fund, and that fund is, part, as you say, part from the crown estate and the, the profits from that, but also from the British taxpayer, they contribute to that as well. I think it works out to sort of two, two and a half dollars or something a year, a year. per person. Um, but it's always been the thing that I think the royals have had going against them. People talk about how much it costs to keep a monarchy and how much they're worth to the country. And of course, we're, this is at a time, even now, we're going through a cost of living crisis. We're falling into our, one of probably our worst recessions in recorded history. Um, the National Health Service is c receiving cuts. Social care is, is you know, locked down by half a billion dollars in the last five years in terms of their funding. So and, and Charles just turned over a billion of crown money to um, social causes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so, th so the, the royal family are constantly trying to prove their worth to the world. And I think for Harry and Meghan, uh, they felt that part of their problems sort of stemmed would, would join to the fact that many people felt there was an ownership of them. I think for Megan, again, this was on that last day with her, she spoke about 
you know, she felt like her child had to be served on a silver platter when she was born, because there is a feeling of ownership over royal children in the country. We want to hear the birth announcement straight away. We want to see the first pictures. We want video footage. We want to be just as much part of their lives as, as the family are in many ways. And we feel that we're entitled to that because we fund their existence. Mm -hmm. So for Harry, there was this idea of, well, what if we break away from that funding and we fund ourselves? we can still carry out the work in the name of the Queen and uphold her values and everything that we do, but at the same time, we can also step away from that relationship with the press, because the press, of course, also feel just as entitled, um, and that would solve some of our problems. Was but that you, naive? I think it was wishful thinking. You know, it's like they threw the spaghetti strand at the wall <laughs> and <laughs> hoped that it would stick, but it didn't. You know, and the Queen saw straight through that, and she allowed her, her private secretary and, and those around her to answer back to Harry and Meghan, and they were told no. Um, but again, I think that's another part of the story that many people forget, is that they did, even if it was perhaps not the most uh, well thought out of plans, they did try and put something forward to make it work before they eventually stepped away. Now, I don't think that would have been the case if Charles was king at the time. I think this was very much about their relationship with the Queen mm -hmm. and not wanting to cause offence to her. And I would imagine even if they were given that half in, half out working model, it would never have lasted. And it would have had to have come from the top rather than from them. Yeah. It would have, you know, whatever their their input to it, the announcement, the, the laying out, the, the preparing the runway in a way, had, yeah. would have had to come from, from the top. Exactly. So, um, uh, there were a couple other things that ab about that plan, and and one of the things when I read your book, I was reminded of Princess Diana because when she became Princess of Wales, she didn't want anybody to brief her, she didn't want anybody to talk to her, that she would figure it out herself. Mm. Whereas they were trying to say, look, this is what the previous role of the Princess of Wales has been, and as you alluded to, roles are very difficult. The, uh, Charles had to make his own role as Prince of Wales, and the farther down you get on yeah. the chain, it's it's harder to do that. The Queen had signaled how much support she wanted and how important she thought Meghan could be. American, biracial, divorcee, reaching parts of the Queen's subjects who never had a reason to pay attention to the royal family before. And here was Meghan. And I think that one thing that fascinates me in your book is how all those things kind of missed were missed opportunities. Yeah. And, and there's a real tragedy underlying it beyond just their own lives. It's the tragedy for Britain and the Commonwealth. I think the one challenge that the royal family are always up against is proving their relevancy. Do they still reflect modern day Britain? Do they still uphold the values that the Queen has managed to do for s seven decades of her reign? And Meghan was a real golden opportunity to at least show a side of the royal family that we hadn't seen before, one that was more inclusive, more diverse. I think her just being within the royal family, within the House of Windsor, was, uh, it, it sort of challenged what it meant to be royal and regal. You know, it, it, it challenged the stereotype, and I think Although that was the thing that did make a lot of people feel uncomfortable, it was also the thing that excited a lot of Britain. Mm -hmm. I think many, when Harry and Meghan um, married, compared it to, many people called it sort of our Obama moment. You know, oh, suddenly yes. we had uh, a person of color standing in one of the sort of highest positions, or was in the highest sort of establishments in the country, who could have made a huge amount of change and was willing to do the work. And ultimately, the protection that she needed, that perhaps needed more of because of her differences, wasn't provided. And it's almost exactly the same as what happened with Princess Diana. Princess Diana shone the brightest when she was allowed to do her own thing, but it was the one thing that she was constantly fighting against within the institution. They didn't want her to shine too bright because there were other family members that felt that they Charles, her own husband, exactly felt own completely husband. you know, outshone by And it was very wife. similar with Harry and Meghan. I remember being on tour with them in, we did a tour of Australia, New Zealand, and a couple of other countries I should remember. But um, they, that tour was like being on tour with like 
I don't know, One Direction or The Beatles or something. It was just like screams and crowds, and I'd never experienced that on a royal tour before. But I remember having a conversation with one of their private Palisades that evening, and she went, oh no, they're not going to like this at home, because there's never been a trip to Australia like this before since Diana came over. That's right. The Queen got a reception like that, but she was the Queen, so that was okay. Yeah, and it's different. It's right. a slightly different crowd. This was like young, old, all different backgrounds. It was just unlike anything you'd ever seen for the royals before. Yeah. And, you know, again, that's something they could have utilized, because now, of course, you look at Australia as a country that is questioning uh, their relationship with the monarchy in the future, you know, it was just announced a couple of days yeah, ago. Their five Charles dollar is, bills. Charles's face will no lo will off. no longer be on the back. What are they the putting on instead? A wallaby or? <laughs> I, th I think it's sort of okay. like I, kind of serious. Great <laughs> figures of Australian history, past and present. Okay. But but it but it signals a change, and we see the sort of decline of the size of the monarchy across the Commonwealth realms. You know, Jamaica looks like they'll be the next to announce their. Yeah. The might have beens are really tragic mm. out of all of this. Um, and another thing is that, uh, back to some of the cultural differences, is that she was used to being in Hollywood where you, know, you get paid for runway engagements, where people can give you free goods and mm. put your clothes to wear to promote the product. And that was a, a change along the same lines as if you wear it, it shows that the royals are favoring X over Y. Yeah. And so th there's such a difference from Hollywood. So many rules. And, you know, I think for her, it was just a weird experience to not be earning money. She had spent her whole life supporting herself. And I remember she said to a friend sort of a couple of years into all of this, she said, I feel broke. You know, I don't make any money. And, you know, Harry talks about it in his memoir. He said there were moments where they're furnishing their new home and they're using her credit card to buy things from Ikea because none of them have any disposable income. And, you know, and I think, again, that was that's one of the sides of sort of royal life that you don't think about, you know. They all have inherited furniture over there, over yonder. And well, inherited silver Well, depending on who you are. Some, some do, like William and Kate, get access to the full royal collection and get to furnish their homes with it. And some are told, you know, wait your turn. <laughs> and go to Ikea in <laughs> yeah. the meantime. So, so that, But that is a big cultural difference, which goes to the idea of the monarchy being as the phrase goes, the light above politics. Mm. You can't be shown to favor anybody. And I remem well, remember, I wasn't there in 1917, but World War I, Queen Mary was taking her daughter, the Princess Royal, around to hospitals to visit wounded soldiers. And her daughter, like a teenager, was bitching and complaining, I'm really tired, I don't like hospitals. And Queen Mary did everything but pull her up by her lacy shirt front and say, we are the British royal family. We love hospitals and we are never tired. <laughs> and, and I thought, this is the message that when the royals go out and do their thing, it's about the people they're talking to. Yeah. Once in your lifetime, you're going to meet the Queen or you know Harry and Meghan or Charles. But, but there was one interview that Meghan gave that kind of struck me about the profound difference in culture and attitude because she'd just done this marvelously successful tour in Africa That's right. where an ITV interviewer said, essentially, how are you doing? And the standard royal response would have been, it's been wonderful meeting these incredible people. They're such an inspiration, you know, the, the kind of the royal line. Instead, she said, I'm glad you asked. I'm really feeling terrible. Hmm. And I wonder, part of that was so authentic, but part of it said that that was kind of, again, the mismatch of the royal mission. So it, how do yeah. you think that that's played out? It's interesting because I think there was such a, there was such a, positive response to that moment because I think in this day and age we expect more transparency from our public figures and so to hear a royal family member speaking quite candidly about how she felt you know this is a woman who had just given birth she had just done a huge grueling tour of southern Africa and dealing with all of these issues in the background and so her answer was very honest but it also went completely against the never complain never explain right. mantra of the family which is that stiff upper lip that must be maintained at all times and I remember the controversy of that interview within the royal family William and Kate were they had just flown on a or gone on a tour of Pakistan and I stayed behind in London to cover engagements with Harry and Meghan because as a press pack we kind of split it up so someone will send me reporting from Pakistan and vice versa and I was with their private aide that evening and she was on the phone to William and Kate's 
uh, comm staff, their communication staff, who were so worried about this interview going live and William was asking, can I right. see it? Can we edit it out? Can we get that removed? It's going to overshadow our tour. And there was just always this worry within the family sure. of like, you know, they shouldn't do anything that will overshadow what well, I'm Well, you're, you're absolutely right because there's only one royal narrative a day. And who is going to have that royal narrative? Yeah. And so when Charles was upstaged by Diana, or even the Queen was upstaged by Diana when she wore a new hairdo to the state opening of Parliament, nobody covered the Queen's speech. It was all about Diana's yeah. hair. So this is kind of the, the brutal rationality of life in the royal yeah. family, right? And so much of it you can't control. You know, I think... Kate alone can can overshadow any other royal family on any given day just by wearing a pretty outfit yeah. because ultimately that's what sells papers. I think with Harry and Meghan, despite how polarizing they are or how disliked they've become in the country, they are the only royal family members that guarantee like a 15% sales boost yeah. to a newspaper that day. And so they will even, t from California, in a completely different role, they're still a threat to the royal family in terms of that media exactly. coverage that they lust over. They show up at the farmer's market in Montecito, and it's all over in London. So. That's the one. Um, <laughs> I want to get to your questions, but I want to get a question from you. Now, realize this book is a reported book. It's got interviews. It's got substance and fact-checking. And then we have The Spare, which is like Harry on the couch. And so <laughs> have you read it, and what do you think of it? I did read it, and I thought, firstly, the difference, I think, between the book itself and the coverage of it, it leaked in the most bizarre way in the UK. Out of Spain. It was a copy that went on sale in Spain a few days early that British tabloids then, like, rushed to translate and put sort of fragments of in the papers, and it that told a very different version of the story to Harry's sort of more nuanced take. You know, I think... It's easy to get swept up in the sort of hysteria of, oh my God, Harry's talking about his family members, how could he? And not appreciate the fact that this is such a rare moment to hear from a senior member of the royal family talking about life behind palace walls with great candidness. You know, it's a warts and all book in the best way possible, I think, for a memoir. And for a journalist like myself who spends all my time trying to figure this stuff out from two steps away, it's an incredible moment. I also think that it was time for him to tell his story because there had been just so much speculated on or yes. alleged over the years in the tabloids. And people often question, you know, like his mother did with her own. Exactly. People often question, why is he talking about his private parts in the book, for example? You know, it comes up, he describes them. <laughs> But there's a well, it didn't come up, and that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I just turned this into an R-rated event. I'm sorry. But the, the grim reality of that is that many years ago, there was a British tabloid that ran a kiss and tell with a woman that claimed to have spent a night with Harry, and she had described something very private about him. And so this is his way of like proving all of these things as nonsense and rubbish. So there's, there's reasons for it. Um, it is like Harry Unleashed in a way, and I think that this book's a product of someone that's grown up in an environment where he's been gaslit about many of the grievances that Good he's word. had, yeah. um, but also been silent so many times, or told to keep silent. So when you remove all of those restrictions, you're going to get everything. Well, and, and we did, and the reactions <laughs> continue. And we will also see how it plays out when it comes time for the coronation and whether or not uh, Harry and Meghan will be invited. And we'll read more in your forthcoming book in August. But Thanks. I would like to get some audience questions. So put your hand up. Yes, would you stand up, please? And I'll repeat your question. Okay. Do you think, repeating the question, that Charles will show the kind Thank of you. leadership to bring Harry and Meghan back into the royal fold? And who's in charge? You know, I think it's interesting because when we talk about Charles as a leader, and obviously we've been looking back at his sort of first hundred days or so of his reign, and, and he has handled it effortlessly. He's done a great job. He's picked up the work of his mother and just sort of ran with it. And we're starting to see him put his own stamp on that. But when we talk about leadership, there's one side of that that is questionable. 
this is a father, but also a future monarch, and now the head of state, who had an opportunity to make amends with a son before this book came out, before a Netflix series came out, because as we've heard time and time again, as I've reported many times, for Harry, all he ever wanted was conversations, accountability, and apologies where necessary. And he was he's still, to this day, not being given that moment. He still hasn't heard from his any of his sort of main family members since the release of Spare. And I think for Charles, that raises questions about his ability or inability to convene and command even his own family. Mm. And because it was, you know, if you're thinking of someone who is just li simply living to uphold the values of the crown and to preserve the crown, he should have taken that on then. But because instead, that he becomes chose the to microcosm for his whole exactly, reign. Exactly. And so. it's overshadowing so much. But I don't see a world in which they'll come back because. The, the, the doors are yeah. completely shut. There's but leadership no was a good word, I think, yeah. to use. Thank you. Next question. Yes, here. Um, I would like, in that vein, I know it's not really related to this question, but I'd like to know when would the king be held accountable for what he has done and how many times? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, this, is a, this is, we get this, mm. I'm sure, a lot. The question is, with Meghan and Harry complaining about themselves, putting that story out there, when will the complaining no longer be profitable? And the point has been made, he had one story to tell and now he's told it. Yeah, and I think, and I've, I, I said this quite recently, I think they're in, a, they're in a vulnerable position, I think, where if they continue with this, then they'll become synonymous with drama and we forget what it is that they're actually about. You know, they moved over here to start a charitable foundation and create their legacy within that, but so far, it's been the personal stuff that has really a overshadowed everything else. And I think this year is their opportunity to prove what it is that they came here to achieve. And I know that there's a lot going on in the background and that the foundation has big plans this year and to move on from this story because ultimately people want to see them happy. They want to see that this decision to move over here was the right decision mm -hmm. because people, even at this point, aren't sure whether they're actually happy with the lives that they've created for themselves. In terms of how long will it be profitable for? Forever. I mean, it's what keeps royal correspondence in business. I don't think people are rushing to to read articles about the charity work that royal family members do. We're signed up to the soap opera. Yeah, but. that's true. <laughs> Alas. Somebody else. Let's see. Yes, here. Stand up, please. Yeah, do you ever see a time in the future when the royalty will be like a Scandinavian royalty or something where the king takes a bus? Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Yeah, Five generations uh, now, I, two generations? I, I need to, to rephrase, that, to, to restate that. Thank the question you. is whether they will ever become what's called the Scandinavian bicycling royalty, the ones yeah. who are out and about in public and live very modestly and low key. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good question because I think if you look across Europe and the, the many royal families within it, they have all moved into sort of different working models. They're funding themselves, they're, they're sort of I guess renegotiating their role in modern day society. And I think for the British monarchy, it has for a thousand years held on to that one position and the same model. Um, and that is still the plan moving forward. But I think as time goes by and there are more questions about the cost of them, they're gonna be challenged with sort of at least proving that or having to start thinking about um, a sort of leaner operation. It's mm -hmm. why Charles wanted a slimmed down monarchy to show the world that it can be done on a smaller budget. We still need a few years to see whether that will actually be the case. Um, but I think there are also other examples from the European royals that the ro British royal family yeah. should look at. In terms of the, the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, the Dutch royal family, they've started to um, have conversations about their role in, s in the s slave industry, mm -hmm. and they've looked back at their co colonial past, and they're starting to own that. And these are big conversations in the UK that the royal family is still avoiding, but it would help them, I think, in terms of stepping into a more modern, modern position. Just to run in front of, to run into them in front of the gates of Buckingham Palace and set it behind them. So I, we have a few seconds. I want to do that survey again. So let me see Team Meghan and Harry again. Okay, Team Charles and William, and kind of both sides have a good point. Okay, it looks like you've 
divided some opinion up, but we'll see. <laughs> all right, his book is coming out in August, and of course we'll all be glued to the Coronation Television in May. Look for me over there, I'll be having a hat on, but then everybody else will. <laughs> I won't thank be you in for a hat, coming. But thank you for coming. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you.